Today, as you can see, we're in the back, in the back instead of the front, and this, in a way, marks the fact that today we're doing something a bit different. The talks so far have been very much conversations among artists about uh, issues that come up in their practice or in the course of the festival or in the course of the works that they've been doing. Today, uh, this is one of three special sessions within the Performance Art Dailies conference um, that I've called question periods. So each one sort of addresses a specific question and uh, I've invited particular artists to come in and um, provide something perhaps a little more formal than the kind of conversations we've been having that, that really looks at these questions. So my question for today's question period was the performative. So uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Sylvie Tourangeau, our Eminence Grise, <laughs> and Victoria Sten <laughs> and Ben Bale from Montreal, who are working together on a book about this question of the performative. So they seem like the ideal people to address this topic. So I give the floor over to my esteemed colleagues from Montreal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so your feet are firmly on the floor. Find a fixed point in front of your eyes and breathe. Breathe into the floor and into the feet that are on the floor. To the ground, under the floor, under your feet. Nice straight alignment. Wake up your hands at your sides and slowly bring them up to your sides. And extend your hands out. Breathe into your feet. Turn your palms up to face the ceiling. Relax your shoulders. Hold the space. Breathe your hands up so that we face each other above your head. Shoulders nice and relaxed. Breathe into your feet. Feel your roots going down into the floor, into the ground. And as you exhale, you are the mountain. Breathe your hands down. And come out however you like. Vast. 
La nature est un temple où de vivants piliers laissent parfois sortir de confuses paroles. L'homme y passe à travers des forêts de symboles qu'il observe avec des regards familiers. Comme de longs échos qui de loin se confondent dans une ténébreuse et profonde unité, basse comme la nuit et comme la clarté, les parfums, les couleurs et les sons se répandent. Il est des parfums frais comme des chairs d'enfants, doux comme les hautbois verts comme les prairies, et d'autres corrompus, riches et triomphants, ayant l'expansion des choses infinies comme l'ambre, le muscle, le benjoin et l'encens qui chantent le transport de l'esprit et des sens. In his book, The Poetics of Space, Gaston Bachelard speaks of Baudelaire's vast. Vast is breathed into the mouth, producing a calming sound, describing a quietly powerful, receptive state. Bachelard takes Bonheur's vast and turns it into a moment of celebration, a word that opens up unlimited spaces. What is contained in this unlimited space? For Bachelard, it is the vowel a found in vast that creates this world of immensity. It is a sound area that starts with a sigh and extends beyond all limits. Considered vocally, therefore, the word vast is no longer merely dimensional. Like some soft su substance, it receives the balsamic powers of infinite calm. With it, we take infinity into our lungs, and through it, we breathe cosmically. No longer dimensional, hence boundless and full of potential. This enlarging vocal agent induces a forgotten sixth sense, a sixth sense that seeks to model and modulate the voice this delicate little aeolian harp that nature has set at the entrance to our breathing is really, really is, a sixth sense, which followed and surpassed the others. It quivers at the nearest movement of metaphor. It permits human thought to sing. And when I let my nonconformist philosopher's daydreams go unchecked, I begin to think that the vowel a ah is the vowel of immensity no longer dimensional, operating in the unseen, felt nonetheless, permeating all the more. This vocal immensity, occupying that which has extended beyond the limits of one's immediately perceptible boundaries, this sixth sense of soft substance gives way to a seventh. The seventh sense, performance. <laughs> performance as the visual manifestation and equivalent of the sound area that starts with a sigh and extends beyond all limits. Performance in the unseen is the peacefully charged 
and magically powerful moment when intuition is activated beyond the unconscious, making the unknown conscious. The fact of us speaking here today is not because of an intellectual, esoteric, and detached interest in the field of performance, but because of a profoundly invested personal experience in individually and collectively of the world of performance. It's been some time that we've been interested in the vast space and world that is performance. When we meet, we talk not just about what performance is, but how performance happens. We talk about methods of working, because for us, the only way to explore performance is through, through an active dialogue. Performance necessitates a dynamic conversation. The proof of that of this lies with our first experience after deciding to work on a book. Immediately after beginning this project, we decided to hold a special workshop, <coughs> during which time we selected uh, artists and South specific discussions that we knew would produ produce a lively vocabulary, an extended living discourse to help us continue creating a, wor a working lexicon on performance terms and find a way to talk about it in order to then be able to write about it, the various components that make up performance and the making of a performance. Through the workshop, we attended to find words to describe those events, specific particular moments within each person's work <coughs> that are often otherwise invisible and would otherwise disappear into the ether. Ether. <laughs> <laughs> Without realizing it, we embarked on a whole trajectory. The book gave way to performances, artist talks, and more workshops, all in an effort to keep finding and defining that easy seven sense, what happens in the unseen of a performance. I was speaking with uh, the performance artist Ellen Lafayette who told me about an actual situation she experienced during performance presentations in a workshop context. She said that she was getting, I will begin again, excuse me. She said that she was getting a better grasp on the notion of loss in her work. She told me that at the moment when she sent something out during a performance, she did not know everything that was going on between her and the audience. There was a non-visible space and, at the same time, a space of loss, which was part of this direct communication. This equally applied to what she, what she received from the audience and how their gestures also changed something for her. How does one perform while actualizing this continuous process of identity, of identity modification? A way of being both at the service and silencing of the ego and a manner of welcoming changes. She felt like she was in an in-between position, that is to say, neither entirely as before, nor engaged in an identity in the process of construction. It is as though 
she were juggling with the visible and non-visible of a boundless identity system, all the while being in action before an audience. After several, several, after several years of work, she found it very curious to be in the process of creating performance, performances which situate her, despite herself, between two identity layers. It was as though the former performer and the new one lived together in the same space-time and added another dimension to her feeling of emptiness and loss. Being at the service of the performance. It's also amazing to see a performance that makes you forget who you are and where you are. Imagine it. A rock concert, a typical show, a full-on knockdown pop rock band filled with joy, filling the room with joy. The Danielson family are a Christian band. I had no idea that they were a Christian band when I first started listening to them. All I knew was that their sensibility and their sense of musical timing and playfulness and their just sheer childlike wonder completely appealed to me. Quirky to be certain, this isn't mainstream pop. After listening, listening obsessively, I finally had a chance to see them live. And of course I was excited, but I was so happy that their show didn't disappoint me. It's not that because you're a huge fan that necessarily your favorite band can do no wrong. I've been to several shows, as I'm sure is the case for most of you, where you're just so disappointed because they didn't live up to what you thought they would do. But for some reason, this show was so wonderful and so special I was trying to put my finger on why, and I realized it's because of the way they were able to hold the space. Imagine it, a rock concert, a full-on knockdown pop bonanza, and not one ego up on that stage. I'm not exaggerating. I think for the first time ever, I felt something bigger in that space bigger than the band on the stage, bigger than the audience of fans, and bigger than the actual music we heard. Of course, all things combined created the atmosphere that made the show as exciting as it was. But I feel like the whole audience got it, and the band delivered it. Something was floating in that space between us. Yes, they're Christian. <laughs> they, they dress as nurses. This is them serving. This is them there to help people. They also dress as Boy Scouts and Girl Guides. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's part of their shtick. But they were delivering the word of the Lord, as far as I could ascertain. And that is, I know what they'll tell you if asked. But they weren't doing it with evangelical zeal. It was more a kind of happy, love your sister and your brother, but Captain Beefheart meets Sesame Street kind of thing. <laughs> and the thing is, I'm not Christian. And with all due respect, I generally don't respond emotionally or otherwise to any kind of religious sermonizing. And I think that most of the audience in Montreal were probably not Christian either. But I could tell we all got it, and we were all there with them. We all felt the energy in that room, the performance that was bigger than the space <coughs> and the people, and most of all, than the band that played it. That's what we got. 
I'm sure if asked, Danielson would say they're doing it for the Lord. In other words, some force greater than them. So, if I don't believe in Jesus and still have this greater than personal ego, difficult to describe, but I'm sure you would have felt it too if you were there, experience. What exactly was it that I felt? What exactly was going on in that room? When non artists feel compelled to make art, who are they doing that for? Last year, I had a roommate called Christophe, a young scientist from Lyon, France. One of the first things I told him when he moved in is that well, I would be planning to have a fenaison at home. You know, we just moved in the house and uh, he didn't know anything about art. And I said, well, we're going to have a night, an evening performance night here. So, oh, wait, hang on a second. So, Femme Maison is oh, a series, well, just to, to contextualize, it's a series in Gatineau, Quebec, that happens maybe four times a year in someone's house. And so, people do performances inside all the spaces of the house, and they started doing it in other cities, Toronto and Montreal. It's just so <laughs> So, not being an artist, and what's more, not a performance artist, he was in, intrigued by the idea of such an event. This was something that he was not at all familiar with. The event happened, and he took part as a very enthu enthusiastic audi audience member. Christophe is a quiet, introverted type, and I was surprised when, a few days later, he invited me into his room to show me some pictures that he had taken with one of his good friends. It's a friend we doesn't see very often, and whenever they get together, they feel like they need to do something significant. You have to do something significant together. It's not enough to just see each other. They have to make something together. For example, okay, for example, in Lyon in 2004, the two photo photocopy photocopy <laughs> <laughs> hundreds of sheets in various fluorescent colors emulating hand posted signs that already occupy these public spaces. Guerrilla ads promoting escort services. Um, there are texts displaying the words Zuzu et Amour, which could be translated as Zuzu is love. Basically blended up with the multicolored ads and yet gave an entirely different message. to do this. In Berlin, 2005, having not seen each other since the year before in Lyon, once again, they needed to take action. This time, they spent an entire day going from spot to spot, lying face down, face up. Sorry, I just realized something. Next one. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to start again. Okay. Uh, what, in Berlin, 2005, having not seen each other since Lyon, once again, they needed to take action. This time, they spent an entire day going from spot to spot, lying face down, uh, face up, crouched, and huddled on the sidewalks, streets, courtyards, and playgrounds of the city. This day-long commitment was done with zest. What compelled them to do this? And for an entire day? 
Oh, that's a mistake. Oh, <laughs> PowerPoint. That's the <laughs> wrong order. That's why it's okay. <laughs> the next time they met, again in Berlin, we wanted to make it even bigger. The small actions, which provided a great amount of pleasure, gave way to a need to take up even more space. This time, we scouted out a disused parking lot bought some really cheap white paint, they were totally broke, and drew what looks like a giant skull. <laughs> the, the desire to go big came from an impulse to be able to make the drawing visible from high up and far away that maybe even people on the plane would be able to see. At some point, one of them said to the other, wouldn't it be, wouldn't be hilarious if Google Earth takes the picture of this sign while the drive is still there. Sure enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Technical problem. Sure enough, they went online. And there was it. <laughs> <laughs> These two friends self-declared non-artists are essentially making performance. These unselfconscious actions, which is to say they are conscious of what they're doing, but not that they are making art, play an extremely important role in the continuity of their friendship. It's a bounding activity that exists, exists between them as a form of expression and communication of their friendship and commitment to each other. The notion of performance isn't only related to what is being seen. To name the thing that belongs to performance and at the same time doesn't belong to performance, we have to look toward the, to, we have to look toward the seventh sense. It's the thing that we can't name but is larger than the sum of its parts. We know when the performer sends out something, we receive it. We don't see it, but know that something happened. We can't name it, and this is a loss that we have to accept. We have to accept this loss. Il faut accepter cette perte là. And in accepting this loss, this doesn't mean we don't develop a consciousness of being in performance. In the workshop, as in a performance, we are attempting to locate the points, the moments, the effects of the transformation that is produced through the performance, even if we can precisely give it a name. But we can introduce this consciousness within the gestures, action that take place in the performance. This diagram, inspired by Richard Chetnos, shows the links between creation and the social. The infinity loop illustrates a continuous process of interaction between social dramas and aesthetic processes. At certain moments, this interaction is visible, then even again, only to once more become visible, and so forth. This mutual inter-influence between creation and the social prompts changes in perception, perception points of view and attitudes and will cause the viewer to react differently. In this perspective, it is unfolding every act of creation in past consciousness. Now, we know that this transformation phenomenon is not experienced, it's, one, it's a one-way manner. 
The performer is also confronted with, a, confronted with a set of fluctuations in consciousness which arise every time she makes a gesture. In what way can the performer develop a heightened attentiveness to these moments of awakening? These flashes of understanding, these sudden reversals of the situation. How can she, how, just a minute, <laughs> how can she heighten, no, heighten, 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 how can she heighten her own consciousness of the performative moment when she is herself in the process of living and sharing it? Mm. What are the consequences on the performance on the way? In the workshop context, I realized that when performers finish an action and the direct part of their action to the effect of the barely finished action to themselves, the subsequent actions benefit from a sort of added value. It is as though all the subtitles <laughs> Subtleties. 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 Okay, I will. Is it as though all the subtleties of a very near present were brought together in a compactness that multiplies the component of a coherence unfolding step by step? The time allotted to sense and perceive new elements foster the integration of unexpected variations into the next action. Could this in-between space between two actions be an avenue to recognize a performative specific to performance art? During the performance is the way of living this in-between. The point, where, the point where the seventh sense is particularly necessary? So it's going to be hard for the bustles? <laughs> <laughs> no? Thank you. Describe a ha! Got it. A ha! A lucid, lucid moment of revelation. An epiphany like moment that engenders a spontaneously inclusive cosmic shift in perception. <laughs> <laughs> and a ha! Is the simultaneously upwelling of the body's intelligence into the mind and the outflowing of the mind into the body, an interrelation that circumvents ra rational consciousness, which is why A discloses that aha is in your body, not in your beliefs. In <laughs> so this workshop. <laughs> She has pointed this as the yuppie, yuppie. How do you say it? How do you say it? Yuppie. <laughs> the moment in between actions when the body mind knows where to go next. And the performer of the action not only intuitively moves towards it, but then becomes aware of their consciousness around, around it. Yuppie is a kind of interior coherence that may at first seem invisible, but can be more easily recognized when starting to pay closer attention to when those moments arise. It's a kind of non-doing in the doing that still does <laughs> and does the work for you. <laughs> <laughs> the pupi aha! helps to develop a awareness of the right action at the right moment. Deborah Hay says, 
being an artist is inher inherently performative. Performative. It consists of. of <laughs> it consists of for foregrounding and bringing to attention one's continually changing intelligence in action. So, if this aha or yuppie mm -hmm. is in fact an epiphany-like moment mm -hmm. that engenders a spontaneously inclusive cosmic shift in perception, <laughs> then a qualitative leap of the Im imagination takes place to perception plus imagination. <coughs> Comme beaucoup de problèmes psychologiques, les recherches sur l'imagination sont troublées par la fausse lumière de l'étymologie. On veut toujours que l'imagination soit la faculté de former des images. Or, elle est plutôt la faculté de déformer des images. Euh, les images fournies par les, les images premières, de changer les images. S'il n'y a pas changement d'image, union inattendue des images, il n'y a pas imagination. Il n'y a pas d'action imaginable. Imaginant. Si une image présente ne fait pas penser à une image absente, si une image occasionnelle ne détermine pas une prodigalité d'images adhérentes, une explosion d'images, il n'y a pas d'imagination. Il y a perception, il y a souvenir d'une perception, mémoire familière, habitude des couleurs et des formes. Le vocable fondamental qui correspond à l'imagination ce n'est pas image, c'est imaginaire. La valeur d'une image se mesure à l'étendue de son auréole imaginaire. Grâce à l'imaginaire, l'imagination est essentiellement ouverte, évasive. Elle est dans le psychisme humain l'expérience même de l'ouverture, l'expérience même de la nouveauté. Plus, plus que toute autre puissance, elle spécifie le psychisme humain. Comme le proclame Blake, l'imagination n'est pas un état, c'est l'existence humaine elle-même. On se convainc tout ça. Inversement, une image qui quitte son principe imaginaire et qui se fixe dans une forme définitive, perd, prend peu à peu les caractères de la perception présente. Bientôt, au lieu de nous faire rêver et parler, elle nous fait agir. Autant dire qu'une image stable et achevée coupe les ailes de l'imagination. Elle nous fait déchoir de cette imagination rêveuse qui ne s'emprisonne dans aucune image et qu'on pourrait appeler pour cela une imagination sans image, dans le style où l'on reconnaît une pensée sans image. Sans doute, dans sa vie prodigieuse, l'imaginaire dépose des images. Mais il se présente toujours comme un au-delà de ces images, mais toujours un peu plus que ces images. Le poème est essentiellement une aspiration à des images nouvelles. Il correspond aux besoins essentiels de nouveauté qui caractérise le psychisme humain. So, if we take it from here. Yeah. It causes us to fall from the state of dreaming imagination that is not confined to image and that we may call imageless imagination, just as we speak of imageless thought. In its prodigious life, the imaginary no doubt leaves behind some images, but is always more than the sum of its images, always beyond them. Here, we could replace this with performance. The performance is essentially an aspiration toward new images. It corresponds to the essential need for novelty, which characterizes the human psyche. So in these moments and spaces of transformation, something else opens up. In these moments, 
a space of transformation opens up. From Gross's book, the in-between formed by juxtapositions and experiments, formed by realignments or new arrangements, threatens to open itself up as new, to facilitate transformations in the identities that constitute it. This took me a long time to get my head wrapped around, so I'm, I'm leaving just a few seconds, just in case it's necessary. Because <laughs> for me, because one day, one day I read it, it's so funny, I read it, I underlined it, I had no idea why, and I put a question mark next to it, like I know something's there, but I really don't understand what the fuck you're talking about. And then several months later, I read it again with these two. This is the magic of working together. I read it to them, and suddenly uh, it, it clicked. Okay, now I get it. So when we talked about it, it made me bring it back to Anne's example of Christophe. I thought, okay, what's, what's his identity as non-artist who is essentially opening up the space by doing the actions that he's doing? So if we bring it back to Anne's discussion, we see a really good example of a space being open, being transgressed, within the prescribed boundaries of the built environment. In between a lived concrete reality, and referring back to Bachelard, the dream of creativity, lies poetry, a duo of non-artists who feel a compulsion to act to break with prescribed behavior and transform a space for no other reason than desire. An act with no real consequence, yet with much at stake. Who are these people? And from where stems this desire to act? Does this act transform? I want to say yes, otherwise why? Performance in the seventh sense propels the body, mind, spirit into the zone of right. Right place, right time, right action. Le bon geste au bon moment. It's hard to read it on the screen, but this is actually a quote from <coughs> Thich Nhat Hanh. <coughs> Thich Nhat Hanh. Well, it's from Sylvie's book. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there's a quote within a quote. Sylvie reproduced Thich Nhat Hanh in her publication called 15 Minutes of Humanity. Oh, sure. So, right understanding, right thoughts, right mindfulness, right speech, right action, right effort, right concentration, right livelihood. Here's an example of, the te of a text written by one of workshop participants after having uh, engaged with us the conversation that came up of the first experimental workshop I was talking about earlier. I'll read it in French. It's easier. Um, Victoria translated it. 
<rire> la transformation s'engage lorsqu'elle saisit l'ego sur le point de réagir selon ses familiarités. Cet instant de suspension entre la pulsion familière, énergie d'habitude aveugle, et la part de l'inconnu, énergie de fixation obsessive, peut générer une spontanéité renouvelable, énergie d'éveil clair. Autrement dit, entre le passé auquel on s'accroche et le futur qu'on tente de manipuler, existe un instant présent totalement ouvert et sans frontières. Il est plein de tout et vide de rien. En principe, en s'abandonnant à cet instant, on trouve les clés nécessaires pour ouvrir les portes de l'endroit où l'on se trouve vers le geste à poser, le choix à prendre, le mot à dire ou la chose à ne pas faire. La difficulté consiste à trouver le courage de se tenir là, sans connaissance, au creux de cet intervalle. Plus j'observe les phénomènes qui m'empêchent de pénétrer cet espace-temps, plus je peux y accéder. C'est très simple, mais c'est très difficile. C'est si précieux et ça a l'air de rien. Should I read it, or is it not necessary? In English? No, great, just in case. So it's a silicoton uh, text. Yeah, you should read it. I should? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Sure. Transformation occurs when the ego is at the cusp of reacting according to its own understanding. This instant, suspended between the impulse of the familiar, which is the energy of acting blindly out of habit, and the fear of the unknown, the energy of obsessive fixation, can generate a renewed spontaneity. Spontaneity, the, even in English it's hard to say. The energy of sharp awareness. In other words, between a past that we stay attached to and a future that we attempt to control, There exists a present, totally open and without limits. It is full of everything and empty of nothing. In theory, in abandoning oneself to this moment, one finds the necessary keys that will open the doors, which lead one to the action, choice, or word to be done, made, said, or to not do. The difficulty lies in finding the courage to hold that space, the space in the interstice of not knowing. The more I can observe the phenomena that stop me from penetrating this space-time, the more I can gain access. It's very simple, but it's very difficult. It's so very precious, and yet appears like nothing at all. Every creative act involves a leap into the void. The leap has to occur at the right moment, and yet the time for the leap is never prescribed. In the midst of a leap, there are no guarantees. To leap can often cause acute vulnerability. Vulnerability is a partner in the creative act, a key collaborator. If your work does not make you feel sufficiently vulnerable, then very likely no one will be touched by it. So, Jack is a middle-aged, middle American university professor obsessed with his own eventual death. Having been exposed to a lethal airborne toxic chemical, <laughs> His fears are increasingly real, and he is grappling with his own growing anxiety. His extremely intelligent, yet awkward adolescent son, Heinrich, has befriended a slightly older but equally eccentric boy named Orest, who is preparing for his upcoming Guinness Book of World Records challenge. He will sit in a cage with several snakes. The three of them are having dinner together, and then this conversation ensues. Thank you. 
So, Jack says to Orest, you know you can get bitten. We talked about it last time. Do you think about what happens after the fangs close on your wrist? Do you think about dying? This is what I want to know. Does death scare you? Does it haunt your thoughts? Let me put my cards on the table, Orest. Are you afraid to die? Do you experience fear? Does fear make you tremble or sweat? Do you feel a shadow fall across the room when you think of the cage, the snakes, the fangs? So Orest, who speaks of himself in the third person, <laughs> for some reason, replies, what did I just read the other day? There are more people dead today than in the rest of world history put together. What's one extra? <laughs> I'd just as soon die while I'm trying to put Orest Mercator's name in the record book. I looked at my son, eyes Jack. I said, is he trying to tell us that there are more people dying in this 24-hour period than in the rest of human history up to now? Son replies, he's saying the dead are greater today than ever before combined. What dead? Define the dead. He's saying people now dead. What do you mean now dead? Everybody who's dead is now dead. <laughs> he's saying people in graves, the known dead, those you can count. I was listening intently, trying to grasp what they meant. A second... <laughs> A second plate of food came for Orest. But sometimes people, but sometimes, sorry, but people sometimes stay in graves for hundreds of years. Is he saying that there are more dead people in graves than anywhere else? It depends on what you mean by anywhere else. I don't know what I mean. The drowned, the blown to bits. There are more dead now than ever before. That's all he's saying. I looked at him a while longer. Then I turned to Orest. You are intentionally facing death. You are setting out to do exactly what people spend their lives trying not to do, die. I want to know why. My trainer says, breathe, don't think. <laughs> this is Aura's talking. He says, be a snake, and you'll know the stillness of a snake. He has a trainer now, Heinrich says. <laughs> Oris said, he's a Sunni Muslim. Iron City, where they live, has some Sunnis out near the airport. The Sunnis are mostly Korean, except mine's an Arab, I think. I said, don't you mean the Moonies are mostly Korean? He's a Sunni, Oris said. But it's the Moonies who are mostly Korean, except they're not, of course. It's only the leadership. And they thought about this. I watched Oris eat. I watched him pitchfork the spaghetti down his gullet. The serious head sat motionless, an entryway for the food that flew off the mechanical fork. What purpose he conveyed, what sense of a fixed course of action pursued absolutely. If each of us is the center of his or her existence, Orest seemed intent on enlarging that center, making it everything. Is this what athletes do? Is this what performance artists do? Occupy the self more fully? It's possible we envy them for their prowess that has little to do with sport. In building toward a danger, they escape it in some deeper sense. They dwell in some angelic scan, able to leap free of everyday dying. But was Orest an athlete? He would do nothing but sit. <laughs> sit for 67 days in a glass cage, waiting to be publicly bitten. And in an earlier passage, in which Jack hounds one of the university's science profs for info on an as yet non-marketed antidepressant, <laughs> that apparently stems one's fear of death, <laughs> we read this in the book it's called Dilar, which is funny. Apparently, so the drug apparently goes to the part, there's, they've identified a part of the brain that is the fear of death, and this drug goes to that part of the brain and shuts it off. So the scientist, uh, her name is Winnie, so Winnie says to him, I don't know what your personal involvement is with this substance, but 
but I think it's a mistake to lose one's sense of death, even one's fear of death. Isn't death the boundary we need? Doesn't it give a precious texture to life, a sense of definition? You have to ask yourself whether anything you do in this life will have beauty and meaning without the knowledge you carry a final line, a border, or a limit. People think I'm spacey, she said. I have a spacey theory about human fear, sure enough. But picture yourself, Jack, a confirmed homebody, a sedentary fellow who finds himself walking in a deep wood. You spot something out of the corner of your eye. Before you know anything else, you know that this thing is very large and that it has no place in your ordinary frame of reference. A flaw in your world picture. Either it shouldn't be here or you shouldn't. Now the thing comes into full view. It's a grizzly bear. <laughs> Enormous, shiny brown, swaggering, dripping slime from its bared fangs. Jack, you've never seen a large animal in the wild. The sight of this grizzler is so electrifyingly strange that it gives you a renewed sense of yourself. A fresh awareness of the self, the self in terms of a unique and horrific situation. You see yourself in a new, intense way. You rediscover yourself. You're lit up from your own imminent dismemberment. <laughs> The beast on hind legs has enabled you to see who you are, as if for the first time, outside familiar surroundings, alone, distinct, whole. The name we give to this complicated process is fear. He says, fear is self-awareness raised to a higher level. That's right, Jack. And death, Jack says, self, self, self. If death can be seen as less strange and unreferenced, your sense of self in relation to death will diminish, and so will your fear. What do I do to make death less strange, Jack asks. How do I go about it? She says, I don't know. Do I risk death by driving fast around curves? Am I supposed to go rock climbing on weekends? I don't know, she said. I wish I knew. Do I scale the sheer facade of a 90? 90-story building wearing a clip-on belt. What do I do, Winnie? Do I sit in a cage full of African snakes like my son's best friend? This is what people do today. <laughs> so translated, it says, in action, Sylvie is afraid. Make your action. The interval to which the performer Sylvie Coton allows, this decisive instant that channels new possibilities, as Andy Bibi just explained, this moment of integration of which I spoke in illustrating Schechner diagram, are moments which in uh, our moment in which one seeks to escape. In applying individual coaching in a group setting, we, we realized that it is precisely, 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 also this moment in which we tend to accelerate the process in progress. In progress. We act on the impetus, on the first gesture that arises. We rush into the action that we mentally project, rather than welcoming the one that presents itself to us in another form. This action, which is greater than us, belongs to a coherence that is beyond our understanding, but which is even sharper, sharper, sharper than any action we could have methodically imagined. These spaces in between actions are decisive in the actualization and acceptance to be the performer I am in each and every instant. 
It is as though this, these if enter spaces insinuated themselves into the action as sites where crucial matters resurface in such a way that our transformative power catch them in passing and simply breathe new life into them. In the realm of the seven sense, the performer, knowingly or not, takes the pulse of the moment, listening inside to move a response out. Performance as the seven sense is another way of saying performance is the seven sense. It's that state of body, mind, spirit that extends beyond the windows, beyond the ceiling, beyond the walls. It extends even beyond the performer. For the performer of the seventh sense occupies that space between. The performance expands into the interstices. What is in between the audience and the performer? What is this dense space at once so intimate and yet so immense? It's palpable. It's like time in between time. Performance as the seventh sense is time in between time. It's the physicalization of time. This temporal space that not only occupies an energy field that invisibly abounds, but also fills that porous gap between art and life. Art time, life time. Straddling consciousness, creating the liminal transition, sensed beyond the senses. What happens at the end of a performance? A slow transition that is vaguely marked by convention, applause, and the rest of the world, time, settling in. But before the applause, what about that tense moment? Has the performance ended? How do you know when a performance has ended? Does the performance really end? Calling into question the terms and quality of reality. Performance as the seventh sense sits with that tension. The extended moment of interreality. It's that space, that intersection between the frame of the performance which is to say the art experience recognized as such, and the rest of life continuing on. Suddenly, the whole world becomes a possible text, the performance now being digested and testing the limits of space. Sometimes the performance just doesn't want to end. In the unseen, the performance continues anyway even after the performer has wound down, finished, and left. The ephemeral in performance is no longer about the work disappearing once the work has ended. It is now about the performance continuing on in the body, mind, spirit, or perhaps more accurately in the unconscious of the spectator. En français, on dit la performance nous habite. The seventh sense is contained and is a container operating in this unlimited space. <coughs> Artaud calls it a seventh state, joining the tangible with the intangible. Well, to answer the question, it's vast. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I was all excited about that scene that I yeah. <laughs> Just because 